Good morning in Scotland, uh, good evening in Tokyo, and welcome to this event from the Asia Scotland Institute. Uh, my name is Martin Perbrick and I'm the Institute Director. Our focus today is a discussion of Japan-UK relations in the 2020s. Uh, this subject is obviously important because of the exit of the UK from the European Union and the establishment of new trading relations globally, but also I think because of what we share in common as two countries. Um, Japan and the UK, although a great distance apart geographically, are both, of course, island trading nations with, with a history of developing our relations very strongly, especially in the 19th century. Trading goods and, goods and services are clearly vital to both of our countries, more so as technology changes and the type of goods that we buy and sell and the services that we deliver, notably with digitalization, change quickly in the 21st century. Uh, we have two panels to discuss two separate but related areas today. The first panel is chaired by Andrew Milligan, formerly of Aberdeen Standard Investments and now a board member of the Asia Scotland Institute. Uh, and Andrew and his colleagues will discuss trade relations. Um, the second panel is chaired by Govinda Finn, also formerly of Aberdeen Standard, uh, who's now an economist based at uh, Kobe University in Japan. And I'll leave it to Andrew and Govinda to introduce the, the distinguished members of both panels, if I may. Um, Obviously, for normal ground rules for our webinars, uh, please could you um, mute your microphones, disable your camera. We'll, we'll mute it for you if you've inadvertently left your microphone open. Uh, later, after the panels have finished their discussion, um, we, we do aim to get to a question and answer and some discussion with the audience members. Um, and I'd ask that if you have some questions to raise, please could you send them to me or to the entire group and audience through the Zoom chat function. Um, and then we'll, we'll screen through the, uh, the questions as we come to them. Um, I, I'd first like to introduce Roddy Gao, the chairman of the Asia Scotland Institute and, and the founder, who would like to say a few words in opening. O over to you, Roddy. Martin, thank, thank you very much. And um, hello to everybody on this call. As we function in the virtual world, we've all become more adept at using Zoom. And in some ways, um, it, it helps us get people together for a talk of this sort from different time zones and from different parts of the world. And uh, doing this and uh, drawing people together to talk about some of the challenges we face in Asia is very much at the center of what we do at the Asia Scotland Institute uh, in the eight years that we've now been going. And it is to increase people's knowledge in Scotland of Pan-Asia around hugely important topics such as the one that we're going to discuss with the two panels today. So I'd like to thank, on behalf of the Asia Scotland Institute, all of you participating, and now hand over to the, the Consul General for his comments. Thank you. Good morning and good evening. My name is Nozomu Takaoka, Consul General of Japan, stationed here in Edinburgh. I would like to commend the Asia Scotland Institute for organizing this seminar with particularly good timing and venue. Good timing after the Japan UK EPA has entered into force at the beginning of this month, and as the future relationship with the EU is taking shape, while Japanese companies are deciding to continue their operation in the United Kingdom. Good venue, although being online today, Edinburgh has been the key city in the development of economic study by such uh, prominent people like Adam Smith and the business model of the asset management was taking place here in the 18th century. Obviously, Asia Scotland Institute is built on this rich tradition. On top of all these, we welcome outstanding speakers from Japan and the UK, former senior diplomats, economists, and corporate strategists, ready to discuss Japan-UK relations in the 2020s. I would like to commend in advance the Institute's Chairman Roddy Gao, Andrew Milligan, Govinda Finn, and Martin Public for their experience and the tact in ensuring yet another successful event after that impressive seminar held by the Institute two years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Consul General, um, and, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we, we really are very grateful for you taking the time so early. So, ladies and gentlemen, could I please hand over to Andrew Milligan to introduce the first panel. Over to you, Andrew. 
Thank you very much, Consul General, Martin uh, and Roddy, for your introduction to the first of these sessions uh, this morning, uh, lasting about 40 minutes or so, where we're going to be discussing the key issue of trade. Now, clearly, Japan and the UK, as uh, Martin has said, are two of the most uh, important open trading economies in the world. Uh, trading goods between the countries is worth well over $20 billion uh, a year, on top of which there's extremely significant uh, financial and investment flows. Now, uh, what does the recently signed UK-Japan SEPA trade liberalisation agreement mean economically, symbolically and politically uh, for these two countries? Um, how should this particular agreement be seen in, in the broader context of trade between Asia and Europe? Uh, and what are some of the risks ahead, uh, both political and pragmatic, uh, on the trade side? So to help me um, answer these questions, I'm joined by three expert speakers. Um, there are extensive details on the ASI website, so I'm not going to uh, spend a long time. Um, first of all, we have a keynote speech from Keiichi Katakami, who amongst many other matters is chairman at the Institute for International Economic Studies and a former chief negotiator for the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, or TPP. Uh, then we have a second talk, uh, which is going to be delivered by Dr. Minako Marita Yeager, um, she is the International Trade Policy Consultant and Fellow at the UK Trade Policy Observatory, UK TPO, uh, at the University of Sussex. And for anyone interested in trade matters, I heartily recommend uh, their recent research, um, Searching for Value in the Japan-UK Trade Agreement, uh, amongst other pieces which she and they have written. Of course, trade relations between these two countries need to be set into a broader context. Uh, for example, the recent trade agreement between the UK and Canada, uh, the final Brexit outcome uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and other developments such as the Pacific Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, agreed in November. So to help us put perhaps those comments and the three comments of the first two speakers in context, we have a third speaker, uh, Sir David Wright. Um, he is Group Global Advisor for the Sumitomo Mitsui Financial Group, uh, Chair of the City UK's Japan Market Advisor Group, and a former ambassador uh, of the UK to Japan. So let us start with session one. Um, each of the speakers will only talk for five, seven minutes. They're going to be very concise indeed in what they say. So there's going to be plenty of time for questions at the end. So as Martin said, please do send your thoughts through on the chat function uh, and Martin can then assimilate those and, and pass them to the speakers. Uh, enough for me, uh, you wish to listen to the experts. So um, Keiji, could I please ask you please to, to begin with your thoughts? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Andrew, <coughs> and pleasure to take part in this symposium. Firstly, I would like to congratulate the UK for successfully avoiding hard Brexit. Although there remain areas to be further negotiated, it was a welcoming development for the world as well as for Japan. On bilateral front, I'm happy to see the CEPA, CEPA I call it CEPA, between Japan and the UK came into force as of this January. I'm pleased to share with you that CEPA is not merely a duplication of the Japan EU EPA, rather through in intensive negotiation, have agreed on new area and some higher discipline. For example, rule on non-disclosure of algorithm is one example. Also, we have article to cooperate in the area of women empowerment, which is newly stipulated. Today, I would like to talk about what I think is necessary for international trading system to be functional and credible, where Japan and the UK can cooperate as strong supporters of free trade and multilateralism and as countries that espouses high standard trade rules. What we observe today is a danger that the world has been ignoring until they become obvious, especially through four years of former President Trump's trade policy of unilateralism and protectionism and serious confrontation with China on trade as well as high-tech hegemony, which were exacerbated by Corona pandemic. They are one, negative impacts of globalization or aftermath of hyper-globalization, growing unemployment, increasing inequity, aggravated as the economy continue to shift towards information and service sector in which traditional structural adjustment becoming more and more difficult. Two, issue related to under the corona pandemic, such as necessity of securing, securing credible supply chain, as well as to maintain domestic production capability of certain critical goods. Three, 
issues related to how to govern the interface with state capitalism or social market economies. In other words, how to secure a level playing field vis-a-vis -vis countries with different rules or systems. One typical example is the business activities of heavily subsidized SOEs. Fourth, issues stemming from so-called the fusion of economy and security. In other words, it is the issue related to how to manage the necessity to prevent leakage of emerging or foundational technology if deemed necessary from the national security point of view. In the midst of uh, US-China hegemonic library on high tech, avoiding serious uncertainties to business activities is becoming all the more important. Faced with such difficulties, there is an actual risk of country allured into deviating from multilateral disciplines, imposing unilateral tariff for introducing discriminatory measures to protect its own domestic industry and to solve unemployment, to name but a few. These measures are blatant measures undermining the principle of rule-based multilateral trading system. At the same time, it is true that difficulties I touched upon, such as hyper effects of hyper-globalization, spread of COVID-19 threat, necessity to secure a level playing field, were not obvious, nor existed at the time when WTO was established in 1995. But it is also true that they are posing serious threats. March last year, G20 trade ministers have agreed to emergency measures designed to tackle COVID-19 with condition that they must be targeted, proportion, proportionate, transparent, and temporary, and are consistent with WTO rules. At that time, Japan and the UK, I was told, cooperated and made a constructive con contribution at the meeting. This is one example of flexibility shown within the context of WTO and not jeopardizing the basic norms of WTO to meet these new challenges we face today. We may have to think of similar flexible application of WTO rule in other challenges we face today. Also, unfair trade practices such as competition where level playing field is not secured are, unlike in the past, causing serious damages and becoming threat to the multilateral trading system. Currently, Japan and EU and the US are taking initiative to establish rules on industrial subsidies to cope with unfair market distorting practices. Similarly important is to establish common rules to secure a level playing field until the new discipline be agreed by all parties. As the economic impacts are becoming too huge to let those practices intact. But the, these efforts should not be construed as seeking confrontation, but rather it should be regarded as efforts to seek coexistence between market-oriented and non-market-oriented economies. Japan and the UK as fellow stewards of the rule-based order must double down their efforts to strengthen multilateral trading system to counter such serious challenges. I believe the role of Japan and the UK is also more important for as we all know that US under President Biden is pouring all its resources to tackle domestic issue at least for the time being. And also, as we all know, the EU is confronted with difficulties to achieve consensus among divergent member countries in timely month. Lastly, regarding the issue relating to a new framework to govern, sens govern sensitive technology, I will not dwell upon in details today as this is a sensitive political issue rather than that of economic. However, as I mentioned earlier, this issue is already causing serious disruptive impact on certain business sectors. I just want to point out that Japan and the UK not being in the forefront of the library and as world technology powerhouse can cooperate to find solution that can assure predictability to the business. And this again should not be, should be regarded as an effort to seek coexistence and not confrontation. Well, to conclude, I just wish to mention 
that it is my earnest hope that UK will join the CPTPP and together make it to be a prevailing model for the 21st century economic and trading system and Japan and the UK together became, become a force to lead by example. I thank you very much. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed for those thoughts. Uh, some food for thought and indeed I've already sent a question to Martin. I encourage others to send questions as well as they listen to the speakers. May I now introduce the second speaker, um, Minako from the UK TPO, who's going to be thinking in particular for us about the recent UK-Japan trade agreement uh, and what it means. Minako, may I pass to you please? Thank you, Andrew, for introducing me. Um, it is my great honor that the Asian Scotland Institute invited me to here today. And I'm very much pleased to be a panelist together with Ambassador Katakami and Sir Wright. I respect your considerable expertise in foreign world diplomacy for decades. And I fully um, share the insightful and very, very broad view of the world economy. And uh, which is presented by uh, Ambassador Katakami now. Um, today, I'm going to explain the key points of the UK Japan Comprehensive Economic Partnership by Carl SIPA and its role in shaping UK Japan economic relations in the 2020s. So, before explaining about SIPA, um, let me remind you quickly the key feature of trade investment relations between the two countries. Um, Japan and the UK are highly developed economies, and both economies have been strengthening trade investment relations. Um, for the UK, Japan is already the UK's fourth largest non-EU export market. So UK's goods export and services exports over the last 20 years show an upward trend, even without an FTA. So the key is that whether SIPA can further enhance the strong bilateral trade relation. Also, I have to note that the heart of the UK-Japan economic relationship lies in investment. So especially in the context of the UK's inward investment, Japanese companies have been playing an important role. So, and the Japanese investment to Europe has been concentrated in the UK, accounting for almost 40% of its total FDI stock in Europe. So this is because Japanese manufacturers use the UK as a hub for doing business in Europe since the 1980s. Also, the UK is the second largest FDA destination for Japan, accounting for 172 billion of FDA stocks in 2019. So in comparison, the UK's investment in Japan is modest. So UK's FDA stock in Japan accounted for $23 billion in 2019. So the major role of SEPA is to maintain and continuously attract Japanese investment in the UK and opening eyes of UK firms to invest opportunities in Japan. So bearing this in mind, I'd like to explain the key feature of SIPA. The major achievement of UK Japan uh, SIPA is that it provides continuity of the EU Japan Economic Partnership Agreement. I call it the EU Japan EPA. And that means that it ensures predictability and the business certainty. In terms of substance, SEPA is very much similar to the EU Japan EPA, except for some areas such as uh, digital trade provision, as Ambassador Katakami mentioned, and regulatory cooperation in financial services. So notably, the digital trade chapter is a highlight of SEPA as it goes much beyond the EU Japan EPA. SEPA tries to facilitate market-driven digital trade development. A first agreement expanded the scope by reflecting new technologies such as algorithm and artificial intelligence. Also introduced provisions on the cross-border free data flow, a ban on justice, unjustified data localization requirements, net neutrality, and so on. But I'd like to underline here is that SIPA clearly shows UK's policy shift from the EU's digital trade policy approach that values more to data privacy and security towards the Asia Pacific or the UK style approach that value market dynamism and innovation. So interestingly, the scope of digital provisions under UK Japan SIPA even goes beyond CPTPP. So obviously, some provisions are incorporated from the 
Japan UK digital trade agreement that provides similar high standard digital trade provisions under the new NAFTA, that is called USMCA. And market access is almost identical in trading goods, cross border services, and investment. For example, as for, non uh, for tariff reduction, the new UK Japan SEPA basically mirrors the EU Japan EPA with some exceptions. So, as for UK exports to Japan, under SEPA, 99.7% of UK exports to Japan in 2019 would be under zero tariffs in 20 years. This is completely similar to the condition under the EU Japan EPA. Comparing the number of products that face different tariff rates under SEPA and the EU Japan EPA, only 10 tariff lines out of 9,444 face lower tariff rates in 2019. But the UK had no export to Japan in any of these products. So as for Japanese export to the UK, the UK applied the EU's tariff concession in the EU Japan EPA, except for the speedy reduction of tariffs for some industry rules, such as immediate tariff elimination of some automobile inputs and then um, electronic control panels and so on. Um, but for all but two of these products, the UK MFN tariff was in any case zero. So the area of entry and temporary stay of business personnel showed some improvements. So under the EU Japan EPA, the UK's offers to Japan was stricter than the, those of the EU's offer. So the UK improved its offers in some areas in the UK Japan deal, such as new commitment on entry and the temporary stay of a, uh, a company, suppose, and children for intra corporate transferees and Japanese investors' entry. Um, but the still, the sum of the UK's commitment have not yet reached to the reciprocal level in, um, which the Japan offered to the UK. Uh, also the EU under the EU Japan EPA. Lastly, um, regulatory cooperation in the area where little progress was made. In practice, different regulatory regimes are major source of barriers for business. Unfortunately, provision of technical barriers to trade and sanitary phytosanitary measures are identical to those under the EU Japan EPA. All the regulatory cooperation services sectors are untouched except for financial services. So next, I'd like to address the two major role of SEPA as a framework to shape Japan-UK economic relations into 2020s. So first is SEPA as a new instrument to promote policy dialogue between the government and the business of the both sides. Through SEPA, the government and business will be able to continuously interplay towards future cooperation. The agreement is living and the business should actively input into experiences and knowledge to improve agreements. For example, developing a sector-specific regulatory cooperation would be one of the areas to create future opportunities in this regard. The second role of SEPA is, um, is SEPA as a catalyst of renew, renewed business interest. So this is a case especially for UK firms because the EU Japan EPA entered into force just two years ago when the UK was heading towards leaving from the EU. So I observed the UK firms were not fully aware of the EU Japan EPA. So now SEPA entered into force. The key is improving utilization by firms. For that, the UK and Japanese government have to help companies utilize preferential tariffs, such as providing technical support of rule of origin. Also providing opportunities for networking and finding business partners for exports, imports, and finding investment partners, in addition to the existing business framework would be beneficial. So I hope that SEPA would create a synergy between the UK and Japanese companies and enhance the competitive edge at the global level in 2020s. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that analysis of, of SEPA. Um, and I, again, strongly recommend anyone who's interested in the details of, of the UK TPA research, please do go and have a look at their website uh, where there's several reports um, on, on this important issue. 
Um, last but certainly not least, um, may I introduce Sir David Wright, um, who's going to provide the third of our short pithy talks, um, bringing together um, some of the comments um, on uh, SEPA and, and trade into a, into a broader Asian context. Sir David, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Um, and thank you uh, to Ambassador Katakami and to Minako-san for their contributions. I wanted to begin by taking up some of the points which they mentioned um, and uh, then myself to give some views on uh, the future uh, of the economic relationship. But could I, before I start, say uh, how grateful I am to have been invited uh, and, and thanks particularly to you, Andrew, and also to Govinda uh, for uh, making that happen and to see a lot of very familiar faces uh, on the screens. But I was very struck by the fact that, for instance, Ambassador Katakami uh, identified some extraordinarily important uh, features of the SEPA uh, with which I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, the SEPA uh, is uh, a process or has been a process which has brought um, forward a, a new independent relationship for the United Kingdom uh, with Japan uh, in the post-Brexit era. In that respect, it, it is a very important contribution to bilateral relations. Um, Katakami-san um, mentioned also uh, the uh, importance of both countries uh, being supporters for the rule-based order. That is very, very important. Uh, and something which we must not um, uh, allow to escape the attention of our political leaders. Uh, the rule-based order uh, has served the global trading environment well uh, over many decades. Uh, we now, as Katakamisan also said, uh, face dealing with the uh, SOEs that dominate the non-market economies. And it's gonna be very important to see how uh, those uh, contrib contributors to the global economy uh, can be associated uh, with the rule-based order, which is so important to the governments uh, of both the UK uh, and, and Japan. Um, and finally, from uh, what Katakami-san said, I wanted to support uh, his uh, advocacy uh, of um, examination of how uh, trade in sensitive technologies uh, was monitored uh, and was supported. That is uh, one of the most important future opportunities uh, for both economies, and I'm grateful to him for, for raising it. Finally, for the UK, uh, amongst what Katakami-san mentioned, uh, of great importance uh, in the whole CEPA process is that it has brought attention to uh, the UK possibly joining the CPTPP, uh, which uh, you won't be surprised to know or hear that I thoroughly support uh, and which uh, both governments, uh, I believe, will work uh, with great efforts towards uh, in, the, uh, in the coming years. So all those issues uh, which Katakami-san uh, raised uh, are ones which uh, should be recorded, I believe, in the findings of this, this conference. Um, Minako-san uh, referred, uh, I thought also, uh, to the importance of the SEPA and to use her phrase, opening eyes to trade opportunities. As she said, uh, there is visibility for upward trade uh, between the two economies. Investment uh, in both directions has been at the heart of the bilateral economic relationship. Um, that investment began with focus on Japanese investment uh, in, uh, uh, in the UK uh, in the uh, 1980s, as I uh, well remember, and in that respect, having been involved in the uh, negotiations at that time uh, to persuade Nissan uh, to invest in the UK, I have to uh, mention my huge satisfaction and welcome for the news which came out last week uh, to the effect that Nissan intends to both maintain uh, and sustain uh, its, uh, its factory in the northeast uh, of, of England. Um, Minako-san uh, also uh, saw um, SEPA as a form of continuity, uh, and I absolutely agree with her on that. Uh, as she has mentioned, uh, the SEPA includes features, I'll just mention one or two in a moment. SEPA has uh, allowed uh, the two countries, UK uh, and Japan, to shift on, to move on uh, from 
uh, the UK being a part of the EU Japan EPA. Uh, and that is uh, a feature uh, which uh, will um, again be uh, vital uh, in the coming in the coming years. I think it's very important uh, to uh, tell everybody uh, how uh, I have been struck uh, by the attention which has been given to the SEPA uh, in the UK uh, over the months since it was signed and agreed. Um, interestingly, uh, this is an anecdote, but um, uh, the, the, the negotiators on both sides um, uh, of the SEPA have remarked that in fact, uh, not being able to travel was a positive benefit uh, to getting an agreement because uh, the, con the, con the conversations and the negotiations have been able to continue uh, without stopping uh, since it's all been done through uh, virtual exchanges. And that has been a beneficial reflection of what the current um, COVID crisis has brought uh, to our attention. Moving on, um, I think that uh, we need to uh, look very hard at how the United States under the Biden administration uh, will see its relationship uh, with, uh, with, with Japan. It was sad that the TPP was dropped by Trump. To some extent also, uh, the Obama pivot to Asia didn't actually get anywhere. And one of the um, features of the new uh, presidency, I think, will be uh, and, and its relationship with Japan and its relationship uh, with uh, the United Kingdom will be to see how um, the uh, Asian market can be a vital focus uh, to, uh, for, for, for all uh, countries. Um, I wanted to uh, support uh, what, um, what uh, was said uh, by uh, Minako-san uh, in her presentation about regulatory co cooperation. Uh, regulatory cooperation has been enhanced uh, as a result uh, of, of SEPA. Uh, there have been other features uh, of uh, the UK-Japan relationship which take uh, matters on beyond uh, that uh, which existed uh, with the, which still exists under the EU uh, EPA. Um, there's uh, good, the, the, the regulatory cooperation uh, area has extended to complex issues like uh, deference, uh, and the uh, appropriate uh, supervisory framework, uh, the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, which is included in SEPA, is a real improvement. And finally, uh, and I think this is very important to uh, mention, the uh, priority given uh, in the agreement to what I know is a big um, focus of attention for Prime Minister Suga, which is the data and digital trade opportunities. There's a lot of work to be done in those areas, particularly uh, we will need, need to find uh, a way of, in, of, of establishing a common taxonomy uh, for uh, data, um, data trade development, uh, but that will be uh, an indication of one of the benefits brought uh, from this bilateral agreement. And finally, can I mention the things which we haven't, haven't come up so far, um, climate change, uh, it's fundamental for the two countries and with COP26 taking place in the UK later uh, this year, very important. The, the security um, relationship uh, between Britain and Japan is already well developed, but that does not mean that there is not more work com that can be done uh, in, the, in, in the Pacific, um, particularly uh, the South China Sea. Um, the financial dialogue, uh, which has just had a meeting for the third time between the two ministers of uh, finance is well developed and an opportunity uh, for the future. Uh, so, Andrew, uh, that's my uh, reflection upon uh, Kam uh, Katakamitsu -san and Minako's um, Minako uh, comments, uh, with one or two additional points from me. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the phases I took was opening eyes to trade opportunities, uh, which um, I think almost might be a, a summary of this whole event. Uh, but thank you very much for those uh, useful comments, Sir David. Now, uh, my role is over in terms of introducing, uh, introducing and thanking the speakers. I'm now going to pass back to Martin Perbick, who's going to be in charge of the, the Q&A uh, for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, there's, there's been a plethora of questions already, but if you've got any more, uh, please do add. Uh, Martin, may I pass back to you? Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Andrew. You, you're doing such a good job. I was hoping you'd stay, but um, <laughs> anyway, you're still still on the call. Thank you very much. There are some very good questions, and several people um, have other meetings to go on to. So, could, could I ask uh, Martin Barrow, um, who's asked a question? Martin, would you like to come on video and audio? Uh, thank you all for the updates. Um, in parallel to visible trade and all the good work going on on that, following the FTA and so on, what more can Japan and the UK do to enhance the links in tourism and education, particularly as we move on eventually from COVID. You know, the export value of both sectors is huge for, the, for both economies and the world economies and gets under, understated sometimes. And uh, in, in addition, it builds huge amount of understanding and harmony between countries, both tourism and education. And the more investors that go to a country, the more likely that, uh, you know, f students visit them, friends visit, and it builds up links in all kinds of ways. Thank you. Uh, pa panelists, would any of, any of you like to comment on that? I, I, I'll leave it open to any of you. Um, it's just since I'm sitting here in the UK, uh, it's important to recognize uh, both the absolute strength uh, of what Martin has mentioned uh, and the support which uh, those of us involved with Japan over many decades uh, give to enhanced tourism uh, and um, uh, education. Um, but to emphasize that yesterday, just yesterday, um, the difficulties for tourism uh, and by implication education exchanges uh, between Britain and the outside world uh, were identified by government ministers as one of the principal uh, problems for, uh, for our societies created by COVID. And I think uh, to have people like Martin emphasise that we cannot ignore this is very important. Thank you very much. M Martin, I hope that's, um, that, that's a, a satisfactory um, answer, but thank you very much for the very good question. If you don't mind, um, uh, could, could we move on? We have such a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, we have many others who'd like to come on. Could I ask Ian Gow, um, who, who's like who's raising a question? Ian, you said you'd like to ask a question yourself. My question, of course, uh, Sir David actually started to touch on it in his, so I, I asked the question before. Um, clearly, uh, it's wonderful news, and it's wonderful news for Scotland as well. Um, and, and hopefully a revival of a real concerted effort to understand Japan and its importance to us. Um, Japan has, of course, with the American withdrawal, uh, been at the center of developing the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And quite clearly, one can see our partnership with uh, Japan as a wonderful forward base into that whole area, which given the other trade block that's emerging, which is very regional and ASEAN led at the moment, um, it's very, very important that we see Japan in that way. The other thing I wanted to mention was that the very close relationship we have in the rules-based order and, and, and all kinds of regional and super-regional development is that Japan, uh, Britain is putting hundreds of millions into Africa. Japan is putting in billions, as is China. And I just wonder whether... Uh, Anglo-Japanese collaboration on developments in Africa and moving them towards a rule-based order might be, ensuring that they do go towards a rule-based order, might be very important. So I, I obviously there is a, a straightforward Anglo-Japanese context, but what it's doing is opening up um, not just the Indo-Pacific, but Pacific Asia and Asia Pacific, if we get into TTP, and it's that role of working with Japan and working with them in Africa that I see as really good news. I think it's sort of an open question, Ian, or open comment. May I ask, would any of the panelists like to comment on that? I think it, it, it speaks more to collaboration between our countries, sure. um, especially in Africa. It's more of a foreign Commonwealth office uh, question, perhaps, I'm not sure. And it's from... Katakami-san, please. Yeah, thank you. No, I fully agree. And uh, talking about Africa, of course, it's a very important continent and we have seen 
in case of Japan, we have been working under the uh, scheme of so-called TICAD, Tokyo International Conference on African Development. And I think UK, we are also collaborating with the UK on this scheme. So I think we can uh, further develop our cooperation, especially we have this CEPA and also uh, after, after all, we have forgotten the importance of Africa for the time being, but Africa is definitely most important continent in the near future. So I really agree, fully agreed with the importance and the necessity of the collaboration between Japan, especially Japan and UK vis-a-vis uh, -vis Africa. Just a small comment, thank you. So David, would you like to add anything? Yes, two, uh, two I don't want to talk too much, I apologize. Uh, in advance. Uh, two points. First of all, um, the, the, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office is now the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, that reflects the integration of uh, overseas um, uh, aid uh, assistance uh, into, cl more closely into uh, the formulation uh, of foreign policy. And that is, that is a development which uh, will both uh, enhance the effectiveness of the um, funding being made available, uh, and also I think will lead to a closer analysis of where uh, the UK uh, can also uh, be, uh, can be involved directly. And secondly, um, for many years we have been having uh, annual exchanges at official level uh, between the UK uh, and Japan in relation to uh, cooperation uh, and exchange of views uh, on Africa. Uh, I'm sure that will continue, but, but I think we want to uh, support it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, both of you. Uh, we don't want to exclude um, Minako, and uh, I think I think we have a question that maybe you, you possibly uh, enjoy our, our answering, Minako. Um, Aidan Gilbert, uh, Aidan, you, you've posed a very good question. Would you like to ask this yourself, or would you like me to ask on your behalf? Oh, oh yeah, I can ask um, myself. Okay. Uh, oh, come on video. Yeah. Um, so one of the I know that one of the big uh, sort of issues that is talked about with Japan is the aging population and demographic decline. And I know that um, this is a problem as well that is facing the UK and Scotland, um, perhaps not to the same extent, but I know that according to the Scottish government, the age related expenses um, as a proportion of public expenditures is supposed to increase by, I think, five, six percent by mid-century. Um, and so I'm thinking um, in regards to cooperating with Japan, is there sort of room for the UK and Japan to um, cooperate with each other in regards to age-related um, public expenditure and healthcare science? And um, I know in Japan, technology, especially with the Society sure. 5.0 um, uh, plan, it's a big, a big deal. Yeah. It's quite a broad question and, and, and certainly um, a futurist one. Minako, as you're an academic, um, would you like to speak to that? Minako? Um, thank you very much for a very interesting question. Uh, well, um, well, this is, uh, I must say, beyond the trade, but I just basically, I fully agree with you. And um, the thing is, Japan, because of the heavily aging society in Japan, that means what well, positive way that Japan has experienced far ahead from others. And then they, especially in the area of innovation, it's something that the world that Japan and UK can collaborate. Also the world well, um, health system, Japan's approach is quite different from European approach. That means they, you know, before going to hospital, they keep themselves healthy. So that then how to just in a lifestyle culture, the kind of the world, well, the Japanese medicine that or a health style, a food especially, that the, all of these things, well, that there are so many areas where the UK and Japan can collaborate and cooperate, especially the younger generation. They have more kind of the you know, interest to the Japanese lifestyle and cultures. So uh, truly, truly beyond the trade, but uh, we just, we can enhance the bilateral collaboration in this area. That, that's a delightfully positive comment. And I think especially in regard to young people and Sir, Sir David, thank you very much. Just very quickly, uh, Martin, to make the point that uh, the UK Japan 21st century group 
uh, which, uh, as you may know, meets uh, every year, uh, rotating between Japan and the UK, has on several occasions in the past included in its agenda issues of social issues relating to social welfare, including uh, aging, uh, and they need to be encouraged in that way. Thank you very much, both of you. I, I need to hand over to Govinda quite soon for the second panel, but I, may, may we please ask one more question, I think from, uh, from Jenna from Qatar Airways, which, um, which I think talks to our current situation. Jenna, you, you, you asked if you could ask yourself, uh, are you ready to come on? Yes. Please, after you. Yes, Good morning and good evening, everyone. Um, knowing the value of face-to-face -face meetings when conducting business in Japan, do you feel there is a barrier to increase trade opportunities between Scotland and Japan during the pandemic due to the current travel limitations? I know, Sir David, you had mentioned with regards to discussions being a lot quicker um, and easier. And yes, we, we have seen that side with the technology. But going forward, maybe, Monaco, um, you're able to give us an insight if face-to-face Face meetings are still exceptionally important in order to increase our trade. Minako again? Do you, are yes, you... um, yeah, I have to be very short, but thank you very much. Very interesting um, question, Janet. Um, I think, well, the, the, um, I just would like to focus on the last point of the face to face meeting and the movement of personnel. But uh, um, I, I think what the so general, the Japanese business, they really, um, well, the pri kind of the face-to-face -face business is uh, very key. And then especially, as you know, when we look at the micro level, the company by company, that, that it takes really takes long time to start a business in Japan, they understanding each other, different approach, and then cultural, the difference, that there's culture difference. So. Um, if we, I think that the thing is that we used to have a kind of the global companies, you know, the base in the UK, and then, then they are enhancing the economic relation in the UK, Japan. But now on, because innovation and the digital economy, SMEs, the, the, well, the collaboration among SMEs would be the key. In that perspective, well, the, yes, what the face-to-face -face is still important, but it can be that, you know, the culture will be changing as a, you know, good effect of the COVID-19 is a, um, really the enormous change of the digital uh, framework. And then they, people get used to it. So that's also the kind of the chance to promote SMEs based, you know, economies through the digitization. So not necessarily face-to-face, -face, maybe in coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, please excuse me, everyone. I think we have to give uh, Govinda and the second panel a chance um, and, and then we, we have time at the end. So may, may I please thank Andrew for, for pulling this panel together uh, and, and being so thoughtful about the content. Uh, Katakami-san for giving us your time from, from Tokyo and your, your very valuable thoughts, especially about um, TPP. Uh, Minako, thank you very much. I found your, your, your comments quite delightful, especially especially positive in, in the relations between our countries and young people. And, and Sir David, um, thank you very much for your insight, having been ambassador to Japan. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Um, Govinda, may I hand over to you, please? Many thanks, Martin. Uh, and thanks to Roddy and the Asia Scotland Institute for inviting me to moderate a discussion on the digital economy uh, and the post-COVID recovery. Uh, I believe we have 30 minutes uh, and I am keenly aware that the average focused attention span is about 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, so we will do our very best to keep you engaged. Uh, we must begin with a painful truth. Uh, the world is facing a unbearable social and health emergency uh, with over 97 million cases of coronavirus worldwide. No country will grow or recover without the pandemic being brought under control. Yet if we want to move forward, we must embrace digital change, both to live with the pandemic uh, and to help rebuild our economies and societies after the pandemic. We begin our discussion today 
with a keynote address from Naoya Oshikubo, senior economist at Sumi Trust. Naoya will tackle the role of digitalization as an engine of growth in Japan. After, we will move to a moderated panel session and finally uh, an audience Q&A. Uh, again, I would encourage you uh, to submit your questions uh, via the, the chat function. Uh, the, for the panel, we will be joined by Martin Schutz, Chief Policy Economist at Fujitsu. Martin is an old friend, uh, and I've been very fortunate enough to see him speak on a number of events, uh, as well as being a global authority on Japanese policy uh, and business strategy. He also brings a huge amount of what can only be described as vivacity. We will also be joined by David Samaya, Executive Chairman at Sumi Trust. David has had an extraordinary career. Having built businesses in three continents, he is a leading, uh, he is leading Japan's largest asset manager through the twin challenges of COVID-19 uh, and overseas expansion to institutional clients such as pension schemes and endowments. Please do use our chat function on Zoom uh, and we will do our absolute best to answer as many questions as we can. So without further ado, I will hand over to Mr. Naoya Oshikubo. Uh, thank you for your time. I am Naoya Oshikubo, Senior Economist in Semitrust. In this presentation, I will discuss the current status and the issues of digitalization in Japan from the standpoint of the government, private enterprises, and healthcare. Digitalization is the main pillar of economics. Because Japan faces an aging and a shrinking population, it must preserve its economic wealth by improving the efficiency of the economy by promoting digitalization. So let's see in detail. First of all, let's look at the current situation of digitalization in Japanese government. Japan has fallen behind in the digitalization of its government. According to the OECD, only 7% of individuals in Japan have used electronic applications for government services in the past year, the lowest among about 40 countries. It is fresh in our memory that the safety net procedures like uniform cash payment for residents uh, during COVID-19 were significantly delayed compared to other developed countries due to lack of data infrastructure. In Japan, the penetration rate of my number code uh, identity number card for individuals is still low at just under 20%. Without its application for administrative services would be done by post, which is complicated and inefficient. In addition, many cases of inadequacy of the application system and systems breakdown have been reported, revealing Japan's big problem in the usability of the administrative and administrative electronic infrastructure. Also, before COVID-19, the stamp culture had taken root in government offices, and the approval process would not have been possible without the use of paper and stamps. However, while COVID-19 has restricted face-to-face -face activities, the government has supported the move away from the use of stamps. And Prime Minister Suga instructed abolishing paper and stamps in the approval process to promote digitalization. This sounds very little thing, but requesting paper and stamps in every approval process prohibited digitalization in Japan. This is a big step. Furthermore, with the aim of getting every citizen to obtain a My Number card by April 2023, the government is promoting the digitalization of administrative services. Speed has always been an issue for Japanese government office work. But in preparation for the establishment of the data agency in autumn 2021, we believe that digitalization of the government will happen very quickly. As Suga, who is known for his ability to execute, takes a top-down approach to the matter. The data agency will be established to centralize IT business of ministries and improve efficiency of administrative procedures. 
acceleration of a government led move to digitalization will be needed to further encourage investment in ICT in the private sector and to boost data literacy. Second, uh, let's look at the current situation of digitalization in private enterprises. The digitalization of private enterprises has also fallen behind considerably. The percentage rate of remote work in Japan has been the lowest among advanced nations. In Japanese society, going to work has been regarded as a virtue. The IT infra infrastructure of private companies is generally fragile and backward. And paper-based approval, <coughs> paper approval using stamps has become a common practice. The fact that there has been no alternative but to do so has also hindered the penetration of remote work. However, while COVID-19 imposes restrictions on going to work, remote work is gradually spreading at some large companies. Furthermore, the movement to abolish the use of stamps in companies has become more common. We at Sumitrust have been de developing an infrastructure for remote work for some time, but due to COVID-19, the move to introduce remote work has accelerated and work is performed from outside the office in almost all positions. It has now become possible to complete the settlement process electronically. The e-signature <coughs> e business as an electronic contract service has become very popular due to the movement away from using, using stamps. Although there are some issues in labor management and security measures associated with the introduction of remote work, electronic contract service will become widespread in the future and the, and the, inefficient, the inefficient stamp culture will decline resulting in flexible work styles. It is expected that the productivity of private companies will improve as remote work becomes more widespread. Finally, let's look at the current situation of digitalization in healthcare. Japan is also far behind other developed nations in the digitalization of medical care. The utilization rate of online medical care in Japan is considerably lower among the developed countries, which is only, only about 1% before COVID-19. On the other hand, in the United States, the utilization rate of uh, online medical care in 2019 was about 10%. In China, the usage of, <coughs> usage of online medical care was as high as 24%. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, even in Japan, the digitalization of medical care, such as online medical care, is gradually getting popular. In April 2020, online medical care was permitted as a time-limited special measure for COVID-19. As many patients are afraid of becoming, infec becoming infected by COVID-19 from an outpatient visit, the number of medical institutions that are introducing online medical care is increasing rapidly. Due to COVID-19 and relaxed regulations, the number of telemedicine hospitals in Japan has grown tenfold. Although the Japan Medical Association has expressed caution, Suga has instructed making online medical care permanent and further digitalization of medical care is awaiting. However, there are still issues in the expansion of online medical care. The current medical, medical fee structure is such that medical institutions encourage patients to visit the hospital and receive more fees as the number of other patients increases. Thus, there must be change to a more attractive fee structure for online medical services in the future. In addition, while online medical care in Japan is centered on the introduction of IT system, the US and China rely not only on systems, but match doctors with patients and provide menus such as consultation uh, recommendations and health support. In Japan, it will be possible to expand the businesses in the market penetration phase, but in order to establish online medical care and create a market in the mid to long term, it is essential for Japanese businesses to establish a model as a service provider. As I mentioned, the transition to a data society and a sugar is the most important mission that will determine Japan's future as it will improve the efficiency of the economy. 
in the short term, infrastructure development for a digital society led by the government will be an issue. But in the mid to long term, efficient accumulation of intangible assets, such as data and AI algorithm, will be the key to operating an advanced data society. That's all for me. Thank you for listening. Many thanks, uh, Naoya, for your appraisal of Japan's digital strategies. I think it serves two purposes. Uh, first of all, um, we get to learn, uh, learn something there. I didn't realize that Suga uh, was considered uh, an effective, uh, more effective implementator of policy, uh, but we also uh, have a shared uh, framework now for the second part of our session. Uh, which is a panel discussion uh, with David, uh, uh, Martin, and uh, of course, Nauya. So let me begin with a question for Martin. Uh, and, and David, perhaps you have uh, some thoughts on this too. We heard uh, from um, Nauya that the digital economy is at the heart of Japan's growth strategy. In Scotland, uh, Finance Secretary uh, Kate Forbes, Forbes has announced 12 million of new funding for digital, uh, and we'll hear more about these plans this afternoon. But let's stay focused on Japan. The cabinet has approved a new digital agency. How much will be spent? How do you pay for it? Uh, and can it really be transformation, transformational, uh, given uh, Japan's slow pace of change to date, uh, as Naoya was uh, indicating. So, Martin, uh, any thoughts on that for us? Mm. Well, Naoya pointed out that Japan is quite a bit backward on many levels in terms of digitalization. Uh, the main, main reason for that is, well, the focus is really on the overall society from a government perspective. Uh, the idea is, well, to develop the society as much as possible. That means developing infrastructures in the best way. Uh, in Japan, the idea is uh, the best infrastructures are the ones that link people in an analog way. So when you come to Tokyo or the any place, basically, you find the best infrastructures you can find in the world, but they're not the most digital ones. Uh, digitalization is being used where it makes sense and where it provides clear benefits. The idea basically is that, well, to do digitalization effectively, you need to perfect the analog systems and then you add value to come on top of it. It takes time. There was never really a focus on just developing the digital economy. Uh, that is a big problem because, well, when you see what investment goes into California, where our labs at Fujitsu are as well, it is mind boggling what's going on. When you look at China, also the development on the digital economy is moving very, very fast. Uh, in Japan, on the industry side, on the company side, you will find a similar focus as in the government. Uh, it is robotics linking the analog, the digital world and trying to perfect that to develop it not so much on well having the most digital companies when you look at my company that is coming out of well in the very old days out of telecommunication then going into computers it is the foremost uh, 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 ict service company in japan we are now over the last two years changing into a digital transformation company meaning we are using digital technologies to help our partners to help governments as well uh, to digitalize and this is now what happening and this is where I come to your question for sorry for the long introduction uh, Mr. Suga is doing quite a few things a little bit different than Abenomics before and Abenomics was basically about kickstarting the economy again the aging society and so on and so on by pumping money into the economy it was not so much the focus on really changing the fabric of the economy so much Mr. Suga has a much more clear focus on productivity he was running the cabinet office for Mr. Abe beforehand he knows bureaucracy see how things are being done and this means that digitalization is now being introduced with a digital ministry with quite a bit of money uh, 10 trillion 770 billion pounds going into something but not the overall economy this is always research has been done of course this is the private economy it is about the healthcare sector which is backward in terms of digitalization as now uh, as now you was pointing out and the government to really reform an economy, you need digital government. 
Look at the UK. The government is so much more digital now. That helps only when the government is digital and understands what is being needed, what needs to be done. Look at Denmark. Look at the Baltics. That helps. Uh, my home country, Germany, not so digital in the government. That means reforms are really lacking and things are going very, very slowly, as in Japan. So this is an important point, but not in terms of investment. I wouldn't mix the stories anymore that we need much more investment just in digitalization, that we need just another Silicon Valley it is now changing the society, digital transformation. And this is where the government has woken up. This is now the COVID-19 benefit in a way. Everybody went into the home office. Everyone went digital. Companies with telework, everything went digital. And this is where the government thought, oh, wow, just improving analog with digital is not enough. This is now another world. We need to connect it. We need to connect it much faster. Society 5.0 which was the government strategy before and big transformation, very slow. Now much more top down, much more digital. This helps tremendously. So the focus is different. It is not just about government investment, it's really about a big transformation we are seeing right now. Excellent. Uh, and, and David, would you have anything to, to add to that in terms of the role of government in, in, in digital transformation? Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Gavin. I wanted to just thank uh, yourself and Andrew and uh, um, the Asia uh, Scotland um, the Institute for inviting us to great opportunity. I couldn't agree more with Martin's comments. Um, look, uh, just to give a little bit more color, I um, have been visiting and living in Japan since 1978 in different, uh, different fashions and um, uh, just a little correction, I chair uh, Sumitomo Trust, Sumitomo Mitsui Trust Asset Management. Um, the, the shock uh, for us to really move into digital, uh, there are many, many industries and many uh, businesses that were at a certain point in their journey in digital transformation here. But the real shock, the real light bulb moment, the real eye-opening moment was COVID and the government instituting the um, emergency uh, conditions. And we all had to work, uh, move to uh, what we call telework or working from home. And I think then in all of the risk management departments, whether it be in finance or um, a major industry realized, wow, we have to put our BCP plans into, uh, into effect. And there was a comment about underinvestment uh, and infrastructure technology or infrastructure spend uh, on the basics. That was the wake up moment. Um, so listen, on, on, the, on the private side, especially among large corporations, those that are listed on the exchange, those that have a regulatory framework uh, 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 where um, risk is focused on, especially financial services, you, it's not that you will see additional spending, you are seeing it, it's happening as we speak right now. Um, budgets are, uh, have been changed. We are investing uh, our own organization, but across the industry in being able to work from home in a secure uh, and more comfortable environment. The real shock uh, in the public, uh, in my opinion, in watching, because I'm at home, I, I tend to watch some of the morning, the morning shows that a lot of the, um, it used to be the, um, the people that stayed home would, would watch was when it was, it was told to the public in March or April that to get a COVID test, the health office had to send a fax, had to send a fax and communication was done by fax to the doctors and the hospitals. This was the shock moment uh, that really, I think, propelled Japan into, wow, we really need to move. And remember, I think, Martin, you mentioned Japan is very analog. In my opinion, it is the most advanced and the most efficient analog uh, country, society, uh, economy on the planet. Uh, things get done so efficiently to the end user, to the customer, to the client, but it's sort of like the old um, thinking about a computer when people don't understand the computer. Well, there must be little people running around in the little computer making things happen. Well, that it's an exaggeration, but I'm making the exaggeration to make a point. Industry has definitely woken up. And why is it so, you say, can it be transformational, the digital ministry? The reason it's so important is for, for business is symbolism. 
And I go back to Prime Minister Abe's uh, Abenomics, and if you remember the three arrows, uh, uh, you know, uh, physical policy and uh, bringing interest rates down and the currency, et cetera. But what was really important, uh, one of the, one of the uh, parts of the third arrow, I think, was to really set uh, the corporate governance and stewardship code for business, to really move uh, society. And what, what was done, um, there were a number of um, ex council of experts and study groups, and it took a couple of years, but Japan has not just put a corporate governance and stewardship code in place, it's also revised it in two years time. And the Abe government, uh, Prime Minister Abe's government was able to implement amazing changes in corporate governance, i.e. the G of ESG, where the largest pension fund in the world, the GPIF, uh, the Tokyo Stock Exchange put a policies in place that were never here. And the speed at which the change occurred means just a few years later, three years later, really. Um, in my business, we, run, we manage about 700 billion US dollars in assets. We have individuals at our company, myself included, engaging with senior executives, not only at Japanese corporations, these companies that are in our portfolio, but overseas and talking about corporate governance, uh, uh, ESG or green policy, th those changes have happened within five years. That is lightning pace uh, for Japan. And by the way, not only for Japan, compared to many other countries around the world. The digital uh, ministry they, they, is- uh, I'm just yeah. going to say on, on, the, uh, on the digital transformation, your words yes. very much mirror those of, of Satya uh, Nadella, uh, the Microsoft CEO who infamous, infamously uh, said about um, uh, COVID has compressed two years of digital transformation yes. into two months. Uh, and, and you really see uh, how uh, this has been transformational. Um, you're on the ground. So, so what, is the, what does the change actually look like? Do you have some concrete examples? Uh, and, and I think yes. we should and be I, and open I, about I this, benefits and costs. I apologize for going on. I'm just quite passionate about uh, the change that we are seeing here. And, and I'm very optimistic because it's a great opportunity and a great opportunity for uh, the UK and for Scotland. There's a lot that can be provided. Just on the ground, some, some uh, you know, in many businesses, even large companies, just something simple like iPhones or uh, smartphones were, were not handed out to all employees. A certain level of employee could take a company phone home and do some work uh, after, after hours. Um, as uh, Oshikobo san said, the, the culture is to be, you go in the office and you work from the office. That has changed. But some of the things that we're doing, for example, uh, alternative data. When we, when we manage uh, a, a fund or assets for clients, um, we really need to be ahead of all the other analysts out there on the sell side, other fund managers. So we have just uh, contracted to buy a huge suite of alternative special data. It gives us insights into not, not having to wait for Rakuten or Amazon to give us uh, information on their business, but we can actually use data and AI to predict what Amazon or other companies sales will be. We've already invested. I mean, th this decision would have taken prior to, to COVID, would have taken a year. It took us three months uh, to make the decision and to implement. We are also launching a client uh, digital platform. We had talked about that for a couple of years. It would have taken a couple of years to implement it if before COVID, it is happening how we, how we speak. So to your point, the two to five year time frame has come down to six months uh, of implementation here. Thank you very Sorry much that. For, for, for that, David. I wondered if we we, we are talking about um, digital transforming uh, non-tech businesses. Uh, I wonder if we can bring uh, Nauya in uh, to talk to us about uh, the tech sector specifically uh, in Japan. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of talk about bubbles uh, in, in stock tech stocks. So it'd be interesting, what is the current state of play in the actual tech sector in, in Japan? Mm -hmm. 
now are you still with us uh if, if yeah, not, yeah 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 okay okay uh okay uh so as i, sh as I showed in my presentation i think uh, there are uh, uh, plenty of investment opportunities uh, in Japan, especially in areas where uh, digitalization is lagging, such as uh, government, private uh, private companies, uh, medical care, and school education. Uh, we can expect support from Suganomics in these in these areas. For example, uh, in the field of uh, government, uh, Japanese administrative uh, administrative agencies uh, use systems. Uh, designed by uh, different companies for each central government agency and local government. And there are many efficiencies due to lack of uniformity. So information system companies such as NEC, uh, Fujitsu, uh, NTD data are likely to greatly benefit from the promotion of uh, digitalization. Uh, this is because these companies have been uh, responsible for building systems for the central government and local governments. Because they already have strong ties with the government, they are in an advantage uh, position compared to other com other competitors. Uh, okay, uh, that, that's great. I I, I mm -hmm. promise everybody that um, uh, uh, this was not a, a a deliberate ploy to to push uh, uh, Fujitsu, um, even though that's that's an independent assessment. I, I uh, love our valuation. <laughs> it is flying high. It is highly welcome. It will be well invested. But it's more like in Europe. I mean, these tech stocks are really flying high in the U.S. and uh, in in China. When you look at the valuations in Japan, there is only one sector that is flying very high. This is media, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, otherwise, the valuations are up, uh, but business is up as well, so that makes sense. Very good. Uh, I think we will pass over to Martin again uh, to invite our audience members to contribute uh, further in terms of uh, questions, uh, and um, we, we, will, we will do our very best uh, and our panelists will do our very best to, to answer them. Martin, can we pass back to you? Thank you very much, Govinda. Thank you very much, panelists. But perhaps um, could I ask Takaoka san, the Consul General, um, he's made a point about uh, the modality of digital governance regimes, um, actually several times, I think, in the uh, in Zoom chat. Takaoka san, would, would you like to um, share this point and, and, and put it as a question to the panelists? Oh, thank you very much. You know, because I am always interested in how Japan and the UK can affect the uh, global global whole uh, arrangement, and you know, the obviously digital is very very important. And as a recent event showed uh, in in the United States, you know, the Facebook and Twitter, uh, you know, the excluding President Trump, you know, the feed, and the uh, German Chancellor Merkel uh, criticized. Uh, about you know the uh, this got to be done uh, by the uh, uh, government uh, rather than you know the private companies. So uh, it seems that you know there is this contending view how the digital world should be governed, and the uh, EU approach and uh, uh, US approach is certainly different. Uh, as uh, UK has moved out of EU, I thought you know this uh, uh, internal discussion which could take place. Uh, within EU, now uh, UK is out. So uh, uh, I think UK and Japan, and I was, uh, you know, fascinated about, you know, the uh, uh, progressive arrangement in this uh, Japan, uh, UK, EPA uh, regarding digital. So uh, I was uh, very much interested, you know, the uh, how uh, UK or possibly Japan, maybe long way to go, uh, could affect uh, the future making of this you know, the, uh, digital governance, uh, which is you know, the uh, uh, kind of contested uh, between uh, US and uh, EU. Thank you very much. Takaoka-san, this is such an important topic, and the UK is definitely not out of uh, Europe on that one. Uh, uh, the EU is focusing on regulating platforms. Uh, that is an initiative that it's had taken before with GDPR and the Japanese government, and companies have closely collaborated on that one. Uh, the UK government is driving platform regulation, hate speech, and things like that as well. Japan, with the free flow of data globally, in the Pacific in particular, 
particular is focusing on that as well. It was mentioned that TPP is an important, uh, CPTPP is an important issue. Uh, this is basically where we're all in one boat, uh, where we're seeing major developments around the world, mostly coming from the US, also coming from China in Asia. And this needs where the cooperation needs to go ahead. Uh, Brexit is certainly a problem because it gets into the way. But on the other hand, it helps collaboration on many ways. Uh, let's say, for example, my company, Fujitsu, uh, we are running the, the trader support service between Northern Ireland and, uh, and the, uh, within the UK uh, for the UK government. Uh, Fujitsu Services has been focusing on government services like uh, value-added tax systems and so on. And this is what you're, where you're seeing that the corporation is now on all levels really moving ahead. It is getting being connected again. And the collaboration really needs to focus on making things safe. Uh, having them regulated in the digital world, but connected to the analog one, obviously. And this is where the UK and Japan collaboration comes in. In my view, it is still much too little in CIPAR. Uh, these are the next steps where technology development, R&D, and in particular, government collaboration is going on. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's really the, uh, the EU or the UK on that level. Uh, companies are working on that globally, and it is really, really important. Yeah, very enlightening. Thank you very much. And of course, you know, the uh, relations with China uh, becomes uh, next in very important part. Thank you. David, in may the asset management world, uh, I think you, you have something yeah, to say. Go on. Uh, one, just one or two points on that. Um, especially in financial services, but uh, uh, when it comes to uh, any type of uh, customer or client data, data privacy and protection I think are really important. And if there can be a, a mutual agreement and arrangement uh, between uh, Japan and uh, the UK uh, and potentially the EU, I think it would be um, very, very helpful. Uh, and I say this because as we speak, um, our words uh, theoretically can be transcribed and in Zoom, I don't know if people do follow uh, where the data center is, but right now we're, we're working out of an Ireland data center. Um, from time to time, the data centers can be uh, in Singapore or in other places around the world where data privacy um, uh, and, and strength and, and, um, and sort of controls around data privacy uh, may or may not be as high as uh, uh, certain other jurisdictions. The other point I wanted to raise was on, uh, on, on the data or digital side and taxation. And I think there needs to be clarity and transparency uh, and uh, around a, a common view and philosophy around uh, what is, is to be taxed and what isn't to be taxed. Again, in financial services, we wanna remove as, as much friction as possible when we are uh, doing business, when we trade securities, and uh, we have mutual uh, tax agreements when it comes to uh, the investment side. Um, I think we also need to look at the tax side uh, when it comes to digital in the various uh, forms that we, we will see it. I, I know the EU is uh, very keen on taxing some of the large internet giants, but um, uh, remember digital is not going to be just about uh, Google or Facebook. It's going to be about a lot more than that. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, uh, Takoko-san, anything to add? Yeah, very informative. Thank you very much. Uh, it shows that we have a very new horizon and a very uh, influential and important area where Japan and the UK can collaborate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have a little time just for one more question, I think. And um, I, I was struck by something that David said earlier about um, working practices in Japan. Uh, and, and this resonated with me a little bit, having spent 32 years in Hong Kong, where um, frankly, in Hong Kong, in many offices, if you leave the office before 9 p.m., you're not considered to be working hard enough. Um, and, and I suspect in Japan, it's a very similar culture. Um, but clearly we've learned from the pandemic or, or, or in certain countries and cultures, we've learned that um, work is, is not somewhere you go, it's something you do. Um, and, and digitalization is embracing that. But Aidan Gilbert, you, you have a question about this, I think, and perceptions of digitalization in the workforce. Aidan, would you like to come on? Uh, yeah, yeah. So my, my question is, has um, sort of the changes that we've seen with digitalization, has it been embraced, would you say, by um, the Japanese workforce? Or, um, you know, have people been quite resistant to it or have they kind of dived in and um, really embraced the change? 
Well, it's hard to say what is okay. left after we are all vaccinated and dancing on the tables in, let's say, one year's time. Uh, what we are seeing so far, it has been embraced very much, uh, simply because you have to, and it's a big change. Uh, the background story is Japan is very much process oriented in terms of how things are being done and not so much result oriented. Uh, these are the two ways, and we know the difficulties on one side, on the other side for a long time. Uh, process oriented, when you're in the office uh, is a different thing and that means that you, well you stay and you do think now we are much more focused on the results because that is what counts in the digital world when you connect uh, online and when you're staying at diverse places. Uh, we have this in our organization for a long time. Our London office is in, in Baker Street uh, because the city is so expensive and only banker can afford it. Uh, people are working from all over the place for a very long time. They are focusing on dealing with their customers directly. When you look at my company now in Tokyo, we are giving up 50% of our office space in Shiodome, in the city center, uh, all over the country, because we will connect with customers at different centers in different ways. We will collaborate when we have to, otherwise we work at different places. Think about the wonderful Dentsu building, probably one of the most impressive buildings in, in Japan, also in Shiodome. They're using 20% of it right now, and they are selling it, probably just to rent back a few fl uh, 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 floors uh, to run their biggest advertisement company in the world in the future. So it is being taken very, very seriously. David, asset management, I think, yeah. Yeah, if I could uh, add. Um, so how does this translate into uh, actual market changes and moves? And I agree with Martin, there's, there was a lot of change. Um, housing prices, especially for single family homes and land and housing in the regions uh, is soaring. Um, and uh, because when you, you stay at home, Japanese houses tend to be quite, quite compact. And, um, and you do have a double income and home. <laughs> yes, and cold and double income homes, and then you have children. And so um, a lot of hotels are now renting out rooms for those that uh, want to stay in the neighborhood, but, work, but have a place for a home office. But we're seeing, for example, um, in um, in places like Yamanashi Prefecture, uh, you know, near Mount Fuji, the price of property over the last year is up by 30%. There just isn't a lot of supply, but people believe that working from home, they believe that they'll be coming back to the office, but perhaps uh, it won't be a requirement every day. And so they can spend three or four days in the office, but as was uh, mentioned, maybe a day at a branch office where there'll be, there'll be some room for them in a, in a in a hot desking environment, or in a newly constructed, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, cabin in the mountains, um, and that will be accepted. Um, where culturally it wasn't accepted before, you had to be in the office, you had to be in the meeting room. I think those, um, uh, those views have changed, not for everybody. I think there still is an old, you know, they, they call them quite domestic companies who demand that people be in the office, but there has been a great shift and great change. And you see that really, um, it's, it's interesting that some of the large companies won't have the, the demand for office space. I really believe that you'll see, and we, we've done this because we want to uh, offer our staff more space, more square footage per individual. We've actually taken, taken more office space. We're, we're, we've taken another half of a floor of a building we're moving uh, you know, individuals into uh, in March, because we want, given COVID, given the situation of people, you know, sitting very close to each other, we want, you know, our employees to be in a much more uh, friendly environment. So um, you're seeing um, uh, prices move. I think you'll see perhaps um, many companies will, will be able to afford first tier office space where they couldn't afford it before. The SMEs, who are in very old buildings will be able to move to um, uh, you know first tier buildings, and definitely um, uh, you know single family homes. And adding a room, adding two rooms, to be able to have a, a more comfortable experience is absolutely in the cards. Um, Martin, 
David, uh, Noyo, uh, and Govinda, Th thank you very much. V very insightful. I, I think I'm struck by the last comments as well about um, working practices. Um, we, we, uh, we don't work as long hours here, frankly, as people do in, in Japan or certainly Hong Kong where I was. And, um, and that's something to bear in mind that we need, we need to learn something from. Um, Roddy Gao, I think it's, uh, it's, it's not, the sun may have risen in Connecticut, Rod, Roddy. Um, is, is it around 6 a.m. with you, if you'd like to come back on? No, it's 5.30, so uh, but <laughs> I've stolen some hours on the day. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for arranging this. And, and I'm particularly grateful to uh, Andrew and to Govinda for heading up their respective panels on what's been a simply fascinating discussion about the relationship and parallels between Japan and the United Kingdom. And it's great to have the Consul General on the call as well. It occurs to me that it's time we thought of other ways of looking at this relationship. We have eight, uh, eight events coming up uh, between now and the end of March. Uh, they're on a variety of topics as we work together to open people's eyes in Scotland about what's going on in Pan-Asia and sitting here in Connecticut in the United States of America, doing so too, um, and, and watching the influence of the new administration and how things will change. And I think greater American engagement uh, with Japan and, and in that part of the world is going to be critically important because a void was created, which of course China has been busily filling. And I think that uh, President Biden will have his work cut out, but he seems to have picked a very good person to be his Secretary of State and some of the other members of the cabinet, his cabinet are good. But this has been a, a fascinating hour and a half uh, listening to everybody. And I'm extremely grateful to uh, Keichi, Minako-san and Sir David Wright on the first panel and uh, Tadao-san, David and Martin on the second. And I think that uh, I, shall, I shall go ahead today much better informed than when I got up. So to all of you, uh, thank you so much for participating. Please think of ideas of subjects that you would like to discuss or have us explore with you, and we will be happy to partner on any other initiatives of the future. So to all of you, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Goodbye.